Welcome to Uppsala University and App Talk Weekly. My name is Lina Sors Emilsson. I'm your host today together with Karin Tellenberg, who is sitting next to me. Uh, this is a popular science seminar where we will talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on people and society. This seminar is part of the Faculty for Science and Technology's online education initiative for alumni and for other interested members of our society. One of the main goals with this seminar is to provide you all as participants with the opportunity to interact with researchers at our university. Therefore, we encourage you all to use the chat function to ask a question, bring your reflections to the conversation today. The questions will be received by Karin, and we will bring them to our guest in the panel. I'd like to remind you to keep your camera and microphones off, and that this seminar is being recorded. With that, let us talk about artificial intelligence, AI, the impact of our lives and society. And for this discussion, we have invited five researchers from the three different disciplinary domains at our university. From the disciplinary domain of science and technology, technology we have Carolina Velby, professor at the Department of Information and Technology. From the disciplinary domain of humanities and social sciences, we have Anna Sarulin, professor at the Department of Law, Francis Lee, associate professor at the Department of Science and, is it, Department of History of Science and Idea and Sociology. And Oskar Nordström Skans, professor at the Department of Economics. Uh, I also like to mention that Anna, Sara, Francis and Oskars are all three of the scientists in Sweden that have been provided support from the VASP HS, which is a national research program aimed to study the impact of artificial intelligence on science at large and on individual behavior. Our final member of, the disciplinary, uh, member of the panel is from the disciplinary domain of medicine and pharmacy, Anders Isaksson, who is associate professor at the Department of Medical Science. Anders is also one out of nine participants who has uh, been part of uh, a new initiative here at our university, AI for Research, which is a place where researchers come together to share ideas and build projects regarding a artificial intelligence. Furthermore, Carolina Welbe is part of the group who is leading this initiative. Um, there. Uh, to start with this, we will have a before we start with the panel discussion, we will have a short introduction by each of our panel members, three to five minutes, where they will introduce themselves and give their take on AI, people and society. First out is Carolina Belby, who is professor in quantitative microscopy. Carolina and her research team here at Uppsala University is focused on developing computational approaches, including AI and deep learning for extracting information from large biological data sets, especially from microscopy images. Please, Carolina. Thank you, Lina, for that kind introduction. So as, as Lina mentioned, uh, my, my research field is information technology, but the problems that we try to solve are about medicine and biology. And you know, anyone that has taken a picture with a mobile camera knows that the camera can find faces in the image. So the algorithms that I develop don't find faces, but they find, for example, sick and healthy cells in the images. So as humans, we're very good at interpreting images. Uh, but when the data becomes large and complex, when we have lots and lots of images to, to interpret, we're, we're, kind, we're quite limited. And, and as an example, we have recently developed an AI system that can find suspected cancer in prostate biopsies. So it, it works very much like a spell check. You know, when you write a text, some words are, are highlighted by the computer that, because the computer thinks that they're spelled the wrong way. But then you as the writer 
decide if it's spelled the wrong way or if it's maybe just a new term that the computer has not seen before. So when it comes to these um, tumor biopsies or prostate biopsies, this means that the pathologist can be guided to where the suspicious, the suspicious regions are and then find the tumors much faster. And in this way, kind of risk missing some, something that is small or difficult to detect and then in the end make a lot better decisions. So, but the, the, the most exciting part about these algorithms is that they can find uh, new diagnostically important information that we haven't really seen before. So it, apart from this work that is directly focused on, on clinical applications, we also work a lot with basic science and we uh, work closely together with people that develop molecular detection methods. And uh, we use these so that we can sequence RNA directly in tissues using image analysis. And then using AI methods that were originally developed for social networks, uh, we can detect types and subcellular activities based on these decoded RNA. And, and through these combinations of, of molecular detection methods and computational methods, we can gain a much better understanding of the interaction between the tumor and the surrounding. And then we also have a strong interest in explainable AI. What is it really that the AI makes its decisions based on? And this is something that I'm interested in discussing more. So with this, I leave the word back to Lina. Thank you. And I will introduce Professor Anna Sara Lind. Her research focus is on public law, EU law, and fundamental rights. Regarding AI, uh, Anna Sara is the head of a project that is intended to create clear ideas how artificial intellig intelligence may affect rights ethics, worldviews, and social institu in institutions at a global level. You are also very engaged into the WASP H HS project, as I understood it. You may tell us what and how. <laughs> Please, yes, Anna, thank you very much, Lina. And thank you, Lina and Karin, for inviting me to this seminar and being part of, of uh, this discussion. I'm so very happy to be here and to share some thoughts relating to AI and law, but also to present a bit how a multidisciplinary project relating to AI can be constructed today uh, when we see that in technical science a lot happens and that we in social sciences need to adjust to and continue elaborating on. I'm also, as you mentioned, I'm also part of the management team of the WASP HS uh, program, so to say. So um, I'm also committed to that at a na national level. Um, the project that I'm leading, Artificial Intelligence, uh, Democracy and Human Dignity, is a project that started in uh, January. Uh, just as the projects that Francis and Oscar uh, are working on and that they are heading. This means that we just started. The project will go on for four years and I must mention now that we would be very happy to have any comments or reactions, me and my colleagues in the project, in case anyone who is listening or watching is uh, interested in sharing reactions or thoughts. The project is a collaboration between three different academic subjects, one could say. Uh, we have two lawyers, uh, me and my colleague Lars Kalander. We have two philosophers of religion involved, Oliver Lee and, and uh, Johan Edebo. And then we have two colleagues from political science, Johan Weyrud and Jonas Sultin Rosenberg. The project is located at the Center on Multidisciplinary Research on Religion and Society. And it involves three faculties at the university. Not that many researchers maybe, but three faculties. And that's quite a lot um, to say the least. And our intention with this project is to study the implications of strong AI on society. Uh, with strong AI, I guess that we will come back to that later on, uh, one could say, uh, an artificial intelligence where uh, the, a, the machine has a mind. 
we are very, very interested what will happen in the future in relation to society and democracy and law and ruling and decision making if we have a society where many new entities are directed, governed or realized through strong AI. This is a bit tricky. Three different subjects trying to study something that is not here yet. But our intention is to try to do this tricky situation um, clearer by linking it to what is happening at the moment right now. So, my colleagues from philosophy of religion, they are interested in metaphysical issues. They want to study how we perceive human beings and how human rights are considered if we would say it is possible to sit, build something that is uh, of strong AI. Um, the legal analysis of this would be, of course, what opportunities and risks do we face and how will we act as human beings in relation to issues regarding liability, responsibility and fundamental rights? What do we really perceive as being basically human in the legal system and what is necessary when it comes to personhood and legal su subjects? And then my political scientist colleagues, they will, of course, consider issues relating to uh, the autonomous administration in a way. How can democracy function and decision making, making function if decision making to a larger extent is carried out by others than human beings? Will we as citizens become more passive? Will participation decrease or increase, etc.? So these are the broad perspectives that we work on in our project. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Sara. Uh, next person I will in, uh, introduce is uh, Associate Professor Francis Lee, whose primary research interest is, lies in politics, practice and technologies of knowledge. Uh, one of his projects is uh, focusing on how when humans assessments and the traditional scientific methods are supplemented what, with and sometimes replaced with AI technologies, what happens then? Please, Francis. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Francis Lee. I research how digitalization reshapes knowledge production uh, in society. So I'm also part of the WASP HS uh, program that Anna Sara is part of the steering committee, as, as Lina mentioned. I have unfortunately, or fortunately for some, uh, been headhunted to Chalmers University. So my, my affiliations will be incorrect uh, in August. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that, but I'm also looking forward to working uh, with Anna Sara, con continuing to working with Anna Sara. We're, we're having a collaboration with our projects. I'm heading a project that's called AI, a new scientific revolution, uh, where I work with a biologist turned sociologist whose name is Shai Molinari in Lund. And we're in the process of uh, recruiting more people to the project as we speak. Uh, I'm interested in how new technologies reshape how uh, we get knowledge about things. For example, uh, uh, very close to what Carolina Welby is talking to, who then decides about what is uh, new knowledge if you implement an AI system? Who decides what to term a new association or, or uh, a, a new thing that we have found? So I'm interested in like how scientific practice changes when we introduce big data and AI. Who is the researcher? Who decides what's new knowledge and so on? Uh, and my last project was on actually on disease surveillance and how new technologies are reshaping how we know disease in the world, which is a hot topic at the moment. I did the uh, field work at the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention and studied how they used new technologies, new computational techniques, modeling and so on to trace where disease exists. 
And what's interesting to me is that it's not only a matter of, you know, saying this is where the disease is. As you've seen in the papers in the past few days, there's lots of debate about how new technologies represent disease. Is the disease growing? Where is it? How are different strategies working and so on? So, so new now knowledge about the world created through technology is hugely political, and I'm interested in how the politics of organizations and scientists play out with these new technological developments. Uh, and I think one of the most important points that I'd like to get across, across here today is uh, AI is not something which is outside of society. So often we read in the papers that AI will create new jobs or uh, automate other jobs or uh, change the world in particular ways. It will change science, how it's done. We will go from hypothesis-driven science to big data mining and so on. And I would like to just to add from, uh, from somebody who studies science and technology in society that we can't really see AI as standing outside of society. That's, some, that, that's something I feel very strongly about. We have uh, people who are making uh, AI machines. They are thinking about how to make trustworthy AI. We, they are thinking about how to make AI work in particular situations for particular risks and so on. And the risk today is that now we're, when we're in AI, in an AI hype, is that we're, we become technological determinists. This is what we term it in, uh, in the social sciences. We think that technology is a god that comes from the outside and reshapes how the world is. Uh, is. So I think that's what, if, if you remember one thing from this talk, uh, I'd like you to remember we are driving this development. Humans are driving this development. We have choices to make. They will sometimes be difficult, but it is politicians, company leaders, researchers that will decide. Thank you. Now back to you, Lina. Thank you. And congratulations to your new position at Chalmers Technology School. And also I'd like to express that I'm really sad that you're leaving us and I'm looking forward and I will do everything I can so we can continue to build value together with you when you are in Chalmers and still being very associated to Uppsala University. Uh, Oscar Nordström Skans, professor at uh, uh, economics. Uh, your research is centered on empirical studies of labor market, in particular, in particular the role of labor market networks and labor markets impact of new technologies. One of the future challenges for society that you, uh, Oscar, and his team is addressing is what impact robo robots and artificial intelligence will have on the labor market. More specifically, what this transition will involve. Please, Oscar. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, although I'm a little bit sad that uh, Francis uh, stole one of my key points, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to uh, <laughs> provide some uh, added value to that. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm a labor economist, as we say, so it means that I study labor markets uh, using uh, empirical methods and register data, I would say, in general. I also worked a lot uh, on designing or advising policy work in this area and writing reports and commissions and trying to be support to politicians who, who study these issues. Uh, and it's really my interest in this topics really come from my policy side, I would say, because I was doing all these grand reports about what we should do with the labor market, and then at the end, some of them was asked, yeah, but you know, soon all the jobs will be gone, so what is it? what's the point of that? And that's, that's really, I think, uh, a key thing for me at the moment, is trying to think about what technology in general and AI, perhaps in particular, will do to the labor market. And when doing that also, I'm not an economic historian by any standards, but I think when thinking about these things, it, it is useful to try to think about what's, what is different about technology now from the past and what's similar. And if we think about, oh, I mean, every time there's been new technology, people have said, okay, all the jobs are going, okay. We can really see how you can replace all the jobs with the new technology, with the machines or the tractors or whatever you have, 
and no one could ever see what the new jobs would be. Uh, but by and large, what's happened is that technology has helped us produce just immense welfare. Everything that we like and appreciate essentially comes from technology and jobs have not disappeared. Uh, so the question is, is, will it be the same this time or not? And it's very hard, of course, to, to, to know. I think one of the things that we do know from the past, if the future will be anything like the past, is that we need to think about policies for the future uh, because the future will not fix itself, even though I don't think all the jobs will disappear, but the future will not fix itself because the past didn't fix itself. Every time we had big technological uh, revolutions, we changed our institutions completely. We had massive uh, legal reactions, for instance, there was when the railways came, we needed antitrust regulations to, because there were these monopolists that we were growing up that we didn't like and all these kind of things. And this is going to be the same now, for sure. That I think we can be sure. Uh, but it's very tricky to think about what will happen in the, in the future also, because it's, it's very easy to stare too deeply on, on the technology as such. But if we think about it, a lot of the things that we are making predictions or, or thinking about for the future depend on what people like. So when we think about we can replace services through technology that are now performed by humans, whether they will become successful or not, in part depends on what people like, what they're willing to pay for. If they're willing to pay for humans, then humans will continue to do those jobs, even though machines technically can do it. So it's a lot of the things when we're thinking about the future has to do with how both how policymakers will react but also how consumers will react. And sometimes there can be small changes that make huge uh, pivotal changes in consumer behavior. And sometimes there are things that we think, okay, human machine is the same, and it may be the, the, the human surviving anyway, just because we, 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 uh, we like to have a human giving us a massage, even though uh, a machine could be in practice too. So these are important things. And essentially the way I try to approach these things is really because of the problems that, that Anasara also mentioned that we're, we're talking about the future and I like to be an empirical researcher. I have to look at data. So I'm trying to look at what happens in the not so distant past. So say in the last decade or so and trying to think about what we can tell about that development from which kind of shifts we're seeing and trying to make sense of, for instance, skills people will need in the future or, you know, what, what, are, what are the trends that we see in terms of, of these kind of things, which types of skills are more complementary with the services that are provided by new technology and which ones are becoming more obsolete and how should we think about these things. So it's really trying to look in the rear view mirror and uh, from that trying to get some guidance for the future, but, you know, that, that's what we have. So I, I guess I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, Anders. Anders is an associate professor and your expertise lies in genetics when it comes to both the technologies for screening as well as bioinformatic tools to analyze large genetic data sets. As I mentioned, you are also one of the nine researchers that will be physically located at Carolina de Riva, our university library during a one year where you will share ideas and develop research projects. Please, Anders. All right, thank you, Lina. <clears throat> yes, I'm a, a cancer researcher and um, I've been working for many years with using sort of molecular methods describing cancer cells and uh, trying to understand what makes them different and, and trying to, to predict the prognosis uh, for the patients, what is going to happen. And in, in this work, we also use machine learning methods. And uh, the idea is to try to identify which patients might benefit from additional treatment and maybe get ideas on how to do that and, and thereby sort of providing some value for the patient and, and, and improving uh, treatment uh, regimes. Uh, and um, yeah, th this is 
you know, a very difficult problem. And we realized that, yeah, maybe we had sort of an, uh, yeah, we hoped a lot that all this new molecular data could sort of give us these answers combined with the machine learning methods. But I think we found out that it wasn't really only the, the tumors themselves that were important in what happens for the patients, but also the, the, the response of the immune system uh, is also affecting you know, the prognosis and the outcome for the patients. So we are trying to include that in, in our work now and using uh, tissue sections and, and analyzing those with yeah, image analysis methods. Um, yes, and um, I mean, we are working sort of with medical yeah, samples and patient samples and sort of we handle the integrity issues, you know, the way we've always done basically that we have, you know, the regional ethics councils and you propose what you want to do, you say exactly how you're going to use the, the data and the tissue sections, the samples, and you get an informed consent from the patients. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with this, how this works and that it's very transparent. And, and I think we, we have a, a sort of a large acceptance and many, many patients want to contribute and be a part of these uh, studies. And, and that might be a little bit different for for some of the other studies where there might not be informed consent and it's unclear about who's really owning the data and, and so on. But I think that we have sort of large high hopes for how this can impact sort of uh, medical treatments of, of cancer and to improve prognosis and provide better treatments. Um, and we need to collect data from as many sources as possible to have large volumes of data. Uh, and that sort of, yeah, we, we need collaboration between um, yeah, researchers and, and even countries and collecting data from various sources. And, uh, and that will make the systems work better. But we also think that, that this may also lead to, uh, yeah, that we have a wider access to highly specialized uh, treatments and, and diagnostic uh, methods. And I mean, it, it's also possible to, to envision that you have uh, data coming from, from other countries, from other parts of the world where, where um, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, you don't have the same technological yeah, possibilities. Uh, and, and that's something that I'm looking forward to and, and, and I hope to be working uh, towards. Uh, and sort of there are certain issues that we are thinking about. And, and one is, um, for instance, minorities, there might be uh, that you have minorities that might have different genetic constitutions and that are, haven't really been included in the training data in some of these methods. And that might lead to the methods working not quite as well for them. So that's something that I think we should be sort of, yeah, a little bit on, on watch for and, and try to take into account. But it, that's not so easy to do because you, might not really know in advance what you should have been looking for. So I think I'll stop there and, uh, and yeah. Okay, thank you, Anders. Yeah, thank you. Francis, did you want to add something? Or should we go to the first question? And let's say you're, you're, you are muted. I will unmute you. There. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so no, yeah, I had a comment on the, on the, uh, Anders, uh, and I, I just want to clarify. I'm, I'm I'm a huge technology nerd, and I love technology, but my job is to study it in social settings, and therefore it's my job to kind of see the problems uh, with it or the challenges or, or unintended consequences. So uh, one interesting thing with algorithms is that they travel. They they go from one thing to the other. For example, you were talking about how you social me social analysis algorithms to analyze cancer cells, right? Or do you know? Well, it's, it's social network uh, uh, algorithms. I can maybe explain it a bit better. You know, your your own function is related to who you are together with. You yeah. know, when I'm on when I'm playing floor hockey, I'm a floor hockey player. When I'm with scientists, I'm a scientist. So it's the context that kind yeah. of defines my function. And it's so, so, the same for, 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 for people and for RNAs in, in, in cells. 
So, I mean, so that's super interesting because I have a friend who's doing research on music recommendation algorithms. They use the same type of algorithms, uh, social network analysis, and they say, all right, you guys are friends and uh, you, uh, you are valuable for advertising. So they use the social network analysis to value people and you use it to, you, uh, to do cancer cells. So that, let's take on a, another example from a case where it becomes a little bit scary. So I have a, a, a friend who's studying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to be a little bit like Fabric because we have a question. So. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who studies AIDS. And uh, he uh, uh, has looked at how algorithms for AIDS uh, prediction, uh, the prediction of an, of, of an epidemic, the AIDS epidemic, that works on the population level, describes an epidemic, how that's then used uh, to assess individual outcomes for AIDS. Why is that a problem, you ask? Well, you go from uh, collective to individual. You try to predict an individual's outcome on the basis of a collective statistical fact. What's the problem with this? Well, for the AIDS patients, the problem is that they can be assessed with algorithms saying, no, you're lying about your AIDS infection because your AIDS infection is not progressing according to the algorithm. In the case of AIDS, that can make you, make you legally responsible for lying about your infectious disease. So my comment to Anders is, yes, we should all uh, you know, try to develop these algorithms, but it's when they start to travel between different domains, when it becomes possible to kind of go from, in, from collective to individual, then we start having uh, um, issues. So we have tried to predict individual outcomes in the future on the basis of populations. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge problem. Yeah, and that, yeah, thanks. That brings actually back to what Anders also raised, that uh, we have a, a question about minorities where we don't have big data to analyze it. But let's go to a couple from a question from David to Anna Sara. When you describe the term strong AI, you use the word mind. What meaning do you put into the term mind? Exactly. Thank you, David, for this question. <laughs> that is completely impossible for the lawyer to, to answer, as a matter of fact. But I, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm in the start of this project and I'm also in the start of learning myself. So um, it, it becomes a bit mind like that, uh, quotation marks. Um, but if, if we talk about AI, uh, very simplified that we have weak AI or narrow AI and we have general strong AI and we see that as a scale so to say then we are interested in in the parts that are really in the strongest link that where we talk about the mind or if we will have situations where uh, uh, the machines uh, with the algorithms can start thinking more and more like human beings and become humanized in a way, one could say. I that think is not a very scientific <laughs> explanation, but yeah. I thought we were going to talk about what is AI, Lina? I think this is going to bring us back because I think this is a very think, good first yeah. thing, question because what are we talking about when we exactly. talk about AI? Do we have, I, me personally, I think very much of algorithms. I think of mathematical models. What, what are your take on this when you discuss AI? Me? Or uh, well, let's go with Carolina. To <laughs> I, I was just hanging this one out because yeah. it's a very quite tricky one. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you would compare it to statistics, uh, which is also algorithms, I think in, in, in statistics, you, you go step by step and you, you uh, uh, try to find connections between the different types of data that you input and you look at, at distributions and correlations. When, when you work with AI, you're very much more goal oriented. You have the data and you know what the goal should be. And then you let the machine figure out nonlinear correlations or combinations, nonlinear combinations of the data to reach the goal. 
and, and you don't really give any a priori information to the computer what the data actually means. You only say, here's the data and this is the goal we want to reach, reach the goal. Mm -hmm. so, so rather than having control at every step, we, we leave that to the computer to find the connections. And that's the big difference. Okay, so thinking about what Francis was talking about, uh, it makes it very important to understand what lies behind the decision for, for made by an AI system. So, so how can we understand? Is it possible to understand what lies behind the AI system's decision? We talk about the term that is like black box, where mm -hmm. we don't know, but how can we actually understand that? So in, in my field, which is, which is image analysis, uh, there are some, some methods that are, are, I mean, this is a really a, a hot research field, but what you call explainable AI, it's su super important because that kind of helps us to find the limitations of an AI system and also is a way to, to build trust. Um, and, and one really simple way to do it is to figure out which pixels in an image are most relevant for making a decision. So if you, if you have images as input and, and you want to make decisions, if you can then go backwards and, and figure out which pixels are most relevant for that decision, you have something that is humanly interpretable. Do you have any thoughts around this, Anders? Well, yeah, I, mean, I also think, I mean, in, for some methods, it's very, very hard to, to really understand what is contributing to, to the decisions. And, and for other methods, it, it's easier. Uh, but I think from a, like a cancer research perspective, it's interesting to know what information is being used because that can give us clues of trying to devise new therapies, for instance. Um, and I think, yeah, so that's one thing. But I think, yeah, sometimes we, we might not understand it quite as well as we would like, you know, what is really happening. But that's what, why I think that validation is, you know, super important to make sure that, you know, whatever is happening, we can really trust it. So, so that's one way of, of, you know, trying to, to build trust, even if it's, you know, hard for, for everyone to understand what's going on and what's really contributing to the decision. Francis. Yeah, so I think uh, it's an interesting question, this question of transparency, which might not be as simple as we usually think about it. So I don't like uh, messing with cars. I just like getting from point A to point B. I don't want transparency about what the car is doing inside. And uh, sometimes we don't want AI's transparency. We don't want to know exactly what happened. When, when PowerPoint recommends uh, a layout for my PowerPoint slide with their AI system, uh, I don't care. Uh, and and uh, th this can be made much larger. So for example, the tax agency are using algorithms to choose who is being audited for tax cheating. And uh, for example, they don't use AI, but they use algorithms and automate things. Uh, so if you own a horse, you, ha you have a higher risk score for being audited for tax taxes. Apparently, people who own horses cheat on taxes. <laughs> but. <laughs> But they don't want the auditors to know that it was the horse points that made the person be audited, because then they will just look at the horse thing, and that's not how correlations work. So if you own a horse, on, in general, you are, are more at risk of cheating on taxes, but it might not be with the horses. So it, some, in that case, they don't want transparency, because that points people in the wrong way. So I think you know, opening the black box of the algorithm, yes, of course we want that sometimes, and for some people, but not, not everywhere, and for all people. So I think that's also an interesting kind of organizational question to ask about explainable AI. Mm. Uh, Carolina and then Anna Sara. <laughs> well, I, I, I completely see your point, but um, I think in research and in, and in medicine, um, I sometimes think of it not as a black box, but as a gift box. Mm -hmm. uh, and one example that we had was we, one of our early AI systems was designed to uh, evaluate side effects of drugs. And we were using zebrafish embryos to see if their spines were deformed. And our AI system was really good at 
finding the fish that were affected. But then I asked my students to prove that the system really made the decision based on their curved spines. And then it turned out the decision was not made on the curved spines. It was made on a change in the brain of the fish. Mm. And this was something that we had not seen in the images. We hadn't realized the drugs also affected the brain. And, and I think this is super exciting when it comes to cancer, for example. There's so much information in, in uh, microscopy images of, of tumors. And by using AI, we might be able to realize what it is in these images that can tell us about immune response, for example, and what would be the optimal treatment for this patient. So, so in, in some cases, we really want to go backwards and see what was it that the AI detected to make the decision? Anna Sara, you had a comment? I think it's very, very interesting with the different approaches and different doors that a word like transparency opens up for. And, and I totally agree with Francis and, and, and also with the comments that Oscar did earlier on. For me, as now talking as purely a lawyer, so to say, um, as such, trying to handle from a legal perspective a societal change or a new technology or a new technological phenomenon is not something strange. That is what we do all the time. But in this context, when we talk about artificial intelligence or we talk about even towards strong artificial intelligence, uh, I think it's very important that we understand that it does have an impact on how we approach the legal questions, as your examples, Francis, showed. And I think it's utterly important that we don't see AI like uh, a one voice, one thing, uh, a salvation <laughs> operation of society, that we, but that we really are anchored and rooted as lawyers and the legal systems, that we understand that we need to have a rule of law approach, that we need to understand that technological developments for law does mean that we will involve several legislators, several ethical settings, depending upon the field where we are, and we will also blur the divides that we have between private and public and national and international, et cetera, et cetera. And that if we see that and if we approach it, it will be good. But if we put it aside, it will be horribly difficult later on, as your example shows. Thank so you. David is coming in with a question to uh, or a request to Carolina and, and maybe to, to you all if you have some examples. Uh, he writes, could you cite other examples where AI gave insights for research? Do we have other examples? You can think about it a little bit because I will bring and we will come back. David, we're not, I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but, I can add something okay, on what please. we talked about before. I think this, I, the, the, because it's when we think about what AI can do, uh, it's actually a bit different when we think about it in terms of social science and when human behavior is, is in the background, I think. So there are three things that I would think are, are, are important where actually this trying to understand what's going on in the models are, are really crucial. One is, of course, discrimination that a lot of people have been con concerned with. There are some things where, which we're not allowed to make decisions on because we decided that these factors are not admissible in any decision making, like uh, uh, gender and these kind of things. Uh, so that's one thing which I think received a lot of attention. But also the two other things which are really fundamental to economics. And I think for that reason, maybe also has sort of me, sort of led to less use of AI methods I think, in, in this research. So what is, is, is to think about the role of expectations, which is really fundamental in economics. So we all make decisions based on some type of expected outcomes from these decisions. So whenever we use AI, which is a prediction model, essentially, uh, to put up a context where people make decisions. That will change people's expectations. 
So if we don't understand the data, the exact data structure that gives the, the predictions in the first case, then the thing is that the predictions themselves change people's expectations. So you can have easy examples where you allocate money based on some prediction that there should be poor people living in this area because they have certain attributes there. But once that's in place, people may change their behavior. Uh, so the prediction model is no longer valid because humans see the policy that's set into place because of the prediction. That doesn't have it happen to cancer cells as, as fast as that anyway, right? So people change their behavior based on the models. And the third one is a concept of risk because what machine learning models typically does is to use past data to uh, make a prediction. So if you think about credit scores and who you should lend money to, even if every credit institution is, is using a different algorithm, they are all trying to fit uh, the past data. Who could pay back their loans in the past? So if everyone is using a model based on algorithms, they're all trying to fit the same data generating process in the past. So if something changes that, we're really exposed to aggregate risk, right? So if we don't, in particular, if we don't understand where the predictions are coming from, they could be based on very loose sand, something that was predictive of being able to pay back loans in the past, but which no longer is valid. And then we're giving loans to people who cannot pay them back. Then it may be better if there are humans, because humans are a bit uh, erratic. They're doing different things, so we're insured by their stupidity. If you like. So in that sense, we're exposing ourselves to aggregate shocks because we are completely uh, fitting that predictions on the on the more idiosyncratic side. This is very interesting, especially now in the time where we are living, where everything has changed tremendously over just two months. What is happening with all the data to predict the future that we couldn't predict <laughs> where we are today? Uh, we have uh, David came in with uh, another question. Uh, if we demand that AI should have the ability to explain the reasoning to human beings, does that mean that we have to limit the potential of AI? What do you say, guys? <laughs> Carolina? Oh. Yeah, well, I, um, I don't think we should, I mean, looking into explainability is not about limiting the potential. I think exploring explainability is about building trust also, because it's so easy that decisions are made on irrelevant information. Uh, Francis is waving his yeah. hand, you can, if you want to continue on that track. Should we trust AI? So, I mean, that's, uh, that's another question that, you know, when I, I don't have an opinion on it, but when I study people who work with computer systems, there's always debate between different camps, between different scientists, between different bureaucrats, between different disease specialists. Should we trust the machine? And, I, uh, and the answers to that are different. Uh, should we build, the, uh, should we put our decision eggs into the computer? That's a, another question to think about. Should we limit AI? Uh, all right, May, maybe we should let it loose and let AI make the decisions for it, but when do we want decision points to be made in practice? When do we want somebody human-brained to be able to look at the data? And a, a very interesting example, example that connects to Oscar and Nordstrom scans, uh, discussion about risk is when they use risk prediction system to the criminal justice system in, in the United States, where they use some type of secret algorithm to predict the risk for falling back into the crime. Uh, and when judges look at the system, they get a risk score, but it's difficult for the judges to understand what is a risk score? How do I interpret this risk score? what do I do with it? And often the risk score really negatively affects them and has actually, as some people argue, racist consequences. Uh, so should we build, should we then trust AI? Is, is the question, should the judge trust the system? 
or should the judge learn to question the system and think for themselves? I mean, that, that's uh, another type of question, I think. When it comes to cancer, Anders, is this discussions we have there also? When we look at different diagnoses, when we look at different tissues, should we trust the evaluation of the machine more than of the pathologist? Well, or how would you recommend? <laughs> well, I, I think more of these systems that we are sort of building as a way of making the, the pathologists work more efficiently because it is a very labor sort of intensive work and it's not always very objective. You could have one pathologist say one thing and the other one, the other thing. So I think this is some kind of, uh, yeah, information that the pathologists can use and then sort of make the final decisions. So, so then they would need to know how to interpret uh, these, uh, yeah, these data. And I think it's a way to make them work more efficiently and more eff effectively. That, that's my sort of point of view. I, I, I see this, many of the methods very much as a decision support systems. In, especially in settings where you might not have access to so much expertise, then, then to be guided by an AI system that was trained by experts, I think it can, can really um, increase the, the value of the decision that is made in the end. We have a question related to this discussion from, from we, we don't have a name for this person, but it, it's regarding to if the decision making done, by, done based on AI, if it's done based on AI, who is responsible if something goes wrong? When we really take it to the, <laughs> to the end, who is actually responsible when something goes wrong if the AI have made a decision? Anna Sara, it feels mm -hmm. a bit like it's going to come your way, actually. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the legal system and the issue at stake, so to say. I mean, um, the AI, is not responsible as it is today. I mean, if you have AI in a system in private law, you have the private rule, law rules that apply to responsibility, etc. If we have AI in the public administrative system, so to say, the state or the, the, the county councils or whatever, it is the, the structure regulating responsibility there. Uh, the AI is not responsible. It depends on, on the system or the contract where you find the AI, so to say. Okay, so could we go into a little bit about AI parts of the society and for individuals? How can AI become part of society? How is it part of the society today? And, and how would we like it to be part of the society in the future? And also taking into account personal aspects. Do we have anyone who had a thought about this in your field? That's yeah, sure. It's a, I mean, I feel I'm taking up too much space, but I can always talk. <laughs> so feel free to interrupt Francis. Yeah, <laughs> Go <please>. Francis. <laughs> no, but I think, I mean, so if we think historically about the introduction of electricity, for example, electricity and electric engines first became part, I mean, an electric engines was first something very expensive. Uh, th that you so you had a multi-use electric engine in the household uh, where you attach different attachments so you had a washing attachment and so on and uh, then it started to become cheaper and then you started to build in the electric motor and uh, into different things like uh, like everything that we have around us that can move around and uh, I think AI probably will follow the, the same type of paths and, and in fact I mean every part of society really. It, become, it will become part of the toys we have at home. It will become part of our ritual assistance, the cars and so on. So I think it will be a matter of small AI things becoming being integrated everywhere where, where we will use them. But I mean, now I'm just making a prediction out of, well, from historical data, but uh, I mean, that's one way you could imagine. Vika comes in here with a, with a note and says, in the future, will we have AI system that will be hacked? If so, how to trust? So if we hack our AI system using for medical research or for 
decisions or for economical evaluations or for we we'll, we'll, we'll answer without uh, actually having much to say i guess the, the the hacking is more about the data i guess than the, than the algorithm i guess but of course because the use of ai is really uh, a reason for why so much data is collected everywhere so it's really uh, in that sense exposing if if nothing else at least through that mechanism exposing our integrity to a lot of things because I mean, the reason why we see so many services that are free, where we just pay with our integrity, is because someone is using that data for, for, for training their AI stuff and for, for using it. So that's the data collection and AI is, is really, I mean, it's the same thing in that sense. So, so that's, that's at least something. And I guess in that, also going back to the previous questions, where do we see AI? Wherever there is data, there is AI. And that's, 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 that's that's already ready and and there there's more data collection in, in more things that we think about of course because there's data i mean there's lots of ai in computer games of course but also in the cars and every because everything collects data and and i mean a, a wonderful thing with with these methods is that you would think that it's doing a simple thing because they're essentially prediction models but it turns out that you can formulate not everything, but a lot of problems that you wouldn't think of as prediction problems, two prediction problems, like driving a car. You're trying to predict what you should be doing and then you, you, you tell the car to do that. And um, that's why it's so, so, so general, so powerful. That's why it's gonna give us so many great things. Also, It's easy to focus on the negative things in the discussion like this, but of course it's gonna give us lots of great things, but that's gonna come for free. Uh, all the bad things, that's sort of where it's our job to, to at least as social scientists, uh, to, to make sure that it doesn't happen. So in summary, we could say that we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution where we will have Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robots, and so on. And, and it will come down to having these discussions right now when we are moving into it. And, and that collaboration, co-creation is very important in this discussion and in this development, or to quote you, Francis, we actually decide how we want AI to be part of our society. And with this, we come to an end of this seminar. And Karin and I like to thank the panel for taking time to come in, share your knowledge, experiences, and thoughts regarding this subject. We also would like to thank all the participants who have come in with questions to the panel and sharing to this discussion. And uh, I also like to thank, and Karin, I like to thank uh, our colleagues, because these seminars would not be possible to have without our colleagues here at Uppsala University, especially colleagues from the Unit of Communication and Outreach and from the Uppsala University Alumni Network working with that. And finally, Professor Mikael Jonsson, my colleague at Uptech, where we work to build bridges between society and all the technology activities we have with our university. So thank you for today. And I also like to invite you all to next Tuesday when we are going to meet the Associate Professor Lars Oestreicher. And we will continue to take, talk about com, uh, computers. We will talk about brain-computer interface, interface. And can we read your, what you're thinking? So till next Tuesday and happy week.